This event has been put together in collaboration with the James Hutton Institute and the SEAMS project, and they'll be telling us a bit more about that later on. Um, and the topic is something that I think has huge potential um, for transforming our farming system. So looking at growing two or more crops together and building on those interactions between plants to enable the beneficial impact um, and build some of these um, benefits such as weed control, standing ability, pest control, um, and contributing to kind of more resilient farming systems. So part of the mix in, in the future of farming in the UK. Um, so the objectives of today's sessions are really to increase awareness of crop mixtures um, and to share some of the practical experiences from farmers and researchers from across the UK. And we'll try to break down some of the practicalities of establishment and crop management and harvest um, and also have a bit of a chat about what to do with the end product. It's obviously quite important too. Um, and thank you for when you registered putting in some of the questions that you're looking to address. So we've sought to, to make sure that we cover many of those topics as well. Um, and really delighted to have some of the people who are innovating with crop mixtures on farm on the call as well. So um, please do share your own experiences um, and um, comments um, as we go along. Um, in terms of the agenda, um, we've got a great mix of speakers today, um, people that are really innovating with crop mixtures in the field. So we'll kick off with Ali, Carly and Rob Brooker, um, who'll give us a bit of an overview of crop mixtures in research and practice. Um, and then Andrew Gilchrist from Scottish Agronomy, who will share experience of trialing different cereal legume mixtures um, and then to Gordon Cairns, who will share experience of beans and rye um, for whole crop um, for anaerobic digestion and the benefits within his own farming system. And then Charlotte Bickler from the Organic Research Centre on selecting mixtures and what to do with the end product. Um, and then we'll have about half an hour at the end for questions, comments, discussions and, and sharing your own experiences too. Um, as we go through, do feel free to use the chat. Um, if you look at the bottom of um, the screen, there's a little button there that says chat. Um, welcome to put in comments there, ask questions, and we'll try and pick up some as we go along. Um, I'm conscious with the storm that many of us are eagerly awaiting this afternoon. There's a small chance that we might have some internet issues or, or so forth. If anything happens and you do get kicked out or lose your connection, just use the same um, link that you did to and get back in. Um, you can also raise your hand if you've got any questions. There's a, a, a button on the bottom there. Um, and I should also just let you know that we are recording um, if, um, and that's to be able to share with other people after this. Um, if for any reason you'd like your comment or question or video to be cut out, that do let us know and we can. Um, just very quickly, um, agroecology, if you've not heard of us before, we are a community of farmers and researchers and advisors sharing experience with agroecological practices um, and that's in various ways online and podcast videos and in the field. Um, so do check that out. We're a collaboration of lots of different organisations. Um, so to kick us off, um, I will pass over to Ali and Rob Brooker who will give us view of crop mixtures and the project we're featuring here today. Great, thank you Katie. Rob, are you happy for me to go first or do you want to say a few words? Uh, well I'd just like to say thanks very much um, to Katie and the team for um, putting the event together and giving us a chance to talk to everybody about, about the work we're doing in a number of projects and, and finding out more about how crop mixtures are um, being grown on farms uh, with some examples from here in Scotland. Uh, so what we're going to do in terms of the research projects, we're going to hear first from Ali about the Diversified project and then about the Seams project, which um, I think follows on very much on the approaches that Diversify has taken. So um, yeah, I'll just uh, hand over to you now, Ali. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you. Yes, Katie. Um, and I'll shout when, when I need a slide change. Thanks. So, um, one of the things that we, uh, the, the Diversify project is an EU funded project. It started just over three years ago. And um, it was in response to a, a call for information and knowledge about how 
how intercrops work because although we we acknowledge intercropping isn't a new practice it's something that's been done for for decades by and centuries by farmers all over the world but it's not widely practiced in many parts of Europe and the UK and there's still many things we need to learn to optimize intercropping practice and address and overcome some of the barriers to growing into crops and one of the particular focuses of, of diversify is that the lack of understanding about which crop species work well together as intercrops and um, for whatever purpose and purpose they, they might be needed and which varieties of those crop species should be chosen for intercropping and how to manage those intercrop combinations under different farm conditions. So in Diversify, we've really set out to try and tackle some of these knowledge gaps. And after three or so years of work, we've achieved quite a number of our objectives and we're well on the way to, to, complete, to completing all of the objectives in the, the, in the project. So if you could just go to the next slide, please, Katie. So the approach that we've, uh, we've really try to spearhead in the project is this participatory approach working with different groups of stakeholders to to address some of these knowledge gaps and those mainly have been farmers although not only farmers and um, because one of the things we recognize right at the project outset is there's a lot of knowledge tacit knowledge knowledge held within the farming community about what best practice might be what are the optimal combinations of intercrops in different for, for different purposes and in different conditions so in the first year of the project we carried out a series of workshops across europe in, in part with um, partners in different countries across europe to try and find out what's already known and to get a bit of information about where the knowledge where the farming community felt there were knowledge gaps and where effort would be best focused. Alongside that, we've been developing some of the scientific theories that are, uh, underpin the mechanisms about why particular intercrops work well and why others don't work so well. And using the, the information that we get, we've got from talking to farmers and other stakeholders to try and develop some of those scientific ideas and adopt them within our, our experimental trials. So we've had three or more years of field trial field experimental trials at partner sites across Europe and including North Africa to find out we've particularly focused on cereal and legume varieties in combination but also done some experimental work on species rich grassland to try and find out which varieties of, of different cereal and legume species work best when they're intercropped which characteristics of those varieties contribute to better performance so an example I don't worry about the to the particular detail but examples shown here where we're looking in a barley pea intercrop looking at four different varieties of barley four different varieties of pea, pea just look to see where we get higher highest productivity in the intercrop and which varieties are contributing which ones partner well together so which which pea variety and which barley variety provides the highest yield and then we can start to look at the characteristics of those um, varieties in uh, 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 and how they how they might be contributing to that better performance these trials um, if you could go to the next slide please katie um this kind of information is being feeding through to larger scale trials so a lot of our experimental work is done at small scale allowing us to look at a large number of crop varieties in, co in combination and comparing it with how they perform in monoculture but those are conditions are very different to how we might manage so manage and harvest intercrops at large scale this relevant commercial setting so these trials have been accompanied accompanied by large scale trials to understand the practicalities of intercropping sowing managing harvesting and post harvest processing at at relevant scales for farms and particularly working with farmers to trial intercrops of interest to them in their own on-farm conditions. So we've had farm trials of intercrops, a whole host of different intercrop combinations across Europe, working with farmers to, to trial in, intercrops that are, are, are relevant to them. And this has been really important, this sort of participatory approach, as we're calling it, to designing and testing plant teams, because it's generating practical knowledge about 
why plant why these these intercrops are being selected for specific purposes whether it's for reducing inputs for improving soil health or increasing the efficiency of yield production or whether it's about diversifying crops and bringing biodiversity benefits and it also gives us practical information about how, how um, farmers might set about sowing managing and harvesting and processing these these intercrops and we're trying to gather, or we are gathering that, all that information into outputs that are accessible and useful for researchers, for farmers, for agronomists, and for policy advisors. And this is a whole range of formats, which even includes films that are showcasing the recommendations from the project and some of the tools that we're developing that, for help in decision making. So we've been working with farmers over the past three years and connecting farmers within regions with each other via the, the scientific partners on the project. So we really feel that this has um, placed Diversify in, in, a, in a good position to sort of hand over and pass on that knowledge of the participatory approach to the SEAMS project, which is, has, is providing a really fantastic opportunity to extend this participatory work in, in Scotland, particularly and bringing in the education aspect of it. So this is where there's a great um, chance to influence the next generation of consumers, of young farmers, of environmental practitioners by putting out the information about the potential benefits of intercropping and some of the challenges and, and the practicalities of it to a whole range of different audiences. So I think that's everything that I was going to say. I don't think I've got any more slides, Katie. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rob. <coughs> great, thanks, Ali. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Ali. That's great. So I'll just follow up with the Seams project um, that Ali mentioned at the end there. So Seams is um, sustainability in education and agriculture using mixtures, and we're very, very lucky to have Esme Fairburn Foundation funding to support this work. Um, it's a four-year project and it's coordinated by the James Hutton Institute, but it's a partnership approach and it involves all of the organisations that you can see there on that slide to try and deliver a, a range of different outcomes from the work. So if we could see the next slide, Katie. Um, so the overall aims of the, the project are to develop, promote and implement crop species mixtures, both as a sustainable crop production system. And in particular, we are interested in Scotland, but obviously the outcomes of the work that we're doing there to try and understand how to achieve that are gonna be relevant in a wide range of systems um, globally. Um, but as Ali said, we're building on perhaps the, the, the deeper focus on the mechanism and the practicalities that was in Diversify to extend that and use crop mixtures as a knowledge exchange platform for, for a number of uh, uh, groups that will be there in the end. So first of all, you know, we're very keen to talk to farmers, find out about their experiences with crop mixtures and get them involved in doing some of our trials. So they're following on from the participatory approach of um, Diversify and also the farmer cluster approach of Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. So we're learning a lot from, from those projects about um, how those approaches can be beneficial. But another key thing as well is, is the ability or the opportunity that we've got to, to reach out to um, school kids, which is fantastic really. So these crop mixtures uh, and the science that goes behind trying to understand the benefits of these crop mixtures and their impact on the wider farming environment are really nice platforms for some on-farm education with schools um, to explain how their food's produced, um, alternative ways of doing that that might alter the sustainability of that production, and also about some just basic ecological fundamentals about how plants and animals interact and how that sort of delivers the food that we get. And so one of the, one of the things that we've got funding for, which is fantastic, is to bring schools on site. Um, we're focusing in particular on kids in the sort of 11, 12 year old age range because often those get overlooked because everybody, everybody likes primary school kids when they're small because they're very, they're excited by everything and it gets, it gets harder as they get a bit older. But it, there's good evidence to show if you can catch them at that age, then that hooks them into these issues for the rest of their life. So that's the time to sort of really work on talking with them. So that's fantastic as well. And another group that we're trying to reach out to with, um, our sites as a communication platform are the policy makers and the buyers because we're aware that some of the major challenges to growing crop mixtures, some of them are practical, it's like how do you do it on the ground, but some of them are very much about the marketplace and the policy incentives that are there. So who's going to buy the product in the end? Uh, and, um, you know, what, for example, under, under the future cap, what will be the um, 
what will be the support funding available for these kind of mixtures moving forward and that's going to be critical really um so if we could have the next slide please katie that would be great so we have um a set of core sites which are operating in the main um, arable crop production systems in scotland so that's running down the east coast from murray uh down to the borders and they're almost like the spine in our network and our core site farmers are uh, fantastic i think some of them are with us well i know there's obviously gordon and andrew but i think some of our others are with us this evening and they're doing a great job they've um agreed to be a platforms for the knowledge of exchange and also to run some of these trials with us and what we're really keen to do now is to expand out that spine with a wider set of network sites in the region and, and what we're trying to do there with the network sites is to trial more crop mixtures and, and all of this data the more data we can put together on what works well and how that variation takes place across sites and, and between years the, the better place will be to give advice in terms yeah. of what mixtures to have for local conditions and uh, provide some guidance in that sense in terms what? of support for growing crop mixtures so that's uh, well, that's where we're at with the seams work at the moment um so it's been a it's been an interesting year for us because obviously we expected to be out in the year out in the field doing a lot of um, knowledge exchange with schools and we've had to um radically alter our our plans for this year but we're certainly planning to come back to that next year and uh, and the year after that as well so it's a, it's a critical step for us at the moment I think that might be my last slide there, Katie. Yeah. So we've just got a few pictures here. I mean, uh, Ali, I think you might know these um, might know these pictures better than me. So I wonder if you could just talk us through these pictures of some of the trials that we've been running at the Hutton. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. This is I can. There's a bit of a mixture. So these the first couple of pictures are from one of the Seams Core farmer sites down in the well just south, south of edinburgh in the borders towards the borders and that's um in this trial there is looking at pea barley mixture so the two plots you can see there is pea on the right and, and barley on the left and then further to the left which is shown in this picture are two plots one with pea barley at a 46 ratio and the next the one uh, and, and another mixture is has got both crops if i remember correctly at 100% um so really just to see where the the the, uh, the aim of it was to see what what uh, your benefits you get with a sort of standard sowing ratio of of um pea to legume but also do you get any additional yield benefit if you increase the sowing density um, so you get, if you like, more than 100% of, of the, the sowing density when added together. Um, so the cro crops, I can't remember if it is, I think the next slide shows some, yeah, so this is looking um, down on the crop. I think this is the 40-60 ratio. Is there another one after that? No, sorry. Okay, I d did have some more, but they're not all in there. Um, so yes, we're, we're, I visited that site a couple of weeks ago and the crops were looking really healthy. They were looking as if the maturity of the two crops is, is, is fairly well aligned. So um, weather willing, it's hope, I would be hopeful that they will mature together and it will be relatively straightforward to harvest. Um, there is always a little bit of unpredictability about that because even if you choose varieties with apparently similar maturity times the weather can throw a bit of a curveball in or throw a bit of a span in the works um, because the conditions can favor one partner more than the other and we've had a bit of everything over the years of the trials we've done but I'm pretty hopeful for this particular trial and the next couple of slides these are the fairly early stages so they're not looking like this now this is our own trial at the James Hutton Institute which is also looking at pea barley um, um, combination we've got slightly different experiment to the previous one I've just we've just shown um, at the we're testing two different barley varieties together with a pre pea variety the barley varieties are um, laureates which is a fairly standard commercial variety and then Sansi, which we um, have shown in previous work responds well to low inputs particularly um, low um, minimum tillage soil tillage conditions so we were quite intrigued to see how these two different barley varieties would 
uh, respond when grown at these larger scales uh, when intercropped with pea. We do have a direct drill. This isn't. This is the conventional um, uh, treatment. We also have a direct drill treatment in there where we have had some challenges. And we'll maybe come to those later. So this is again the, the trial, um, looking to get a bit more of a broad view of, of what the trial looked like. So these are large plots um, grow, grown uh, in a replicated trial design in a, in a field um, up near the James Hutton Institute. And again, that these are fairly getting closer to, to maturity and, and harvesting. So um, they're, they're, they were looking pretty good, at least in the conventional plots, less so in the, the, the direct drill plots. They're a bit behind. I don't think I've got any more pictures. Do you want to go forward to the next slide, Katie, just to check? Yeah, okay. Great, thanks, Ali. Um, on that, we did have, um, it's interesting what you're saying around kind of the convergence dates of the, of the two crops with the peas and barley. I know you did the, the trials with lots of different varieties. Is there a difference in terms of convergence with, with changing different varieties? Um, Sorry, I was a bit distracted. I was looking at the, the questions in the chat. So you're <laughs> asking about variety, choosing varieties in, in respect to their maturity times yeah. and convergence. So um, Adrian probably has a bit more experience of this. Sorry, Adrian, just to throw you in there. Um, so might wish to comment, but um, I'll just quickly say that there is a, some evidence, at least anecdotally, that you do get a degree of convergence when growing different species together compared to if they were grown alone in monoculture. Um, they do tend to, they, having said that, you know, if, you, if you've got a late maturer versus an early maturer, they're not going to completely change that, that developmental pattern. Adrian, do you want to, to add anything to that based on your experience? No, I mean, you're right that there is convergence uh, evidence from within species mixture as well as between species. Um, when it comes to things like, uh, I've done quite a bit of work on winter barley uh, with winter peas, and you'll find one year the barley is ahead of the peas, the next year it's the opposite way around, uh, and a variety doesn't even perform very consistently from year to year either. And at the moment, uh, that, that mm. I think is one of the most difficult things to uh, crack in terms of choice of varieties for such combinations. We haven't really worked out the rules of what's causing that issue at the moment. Great, thanks Adrian. Um, and as Rob mentions there, so Adrian works with Ali and Rob at James Hutton. Um, we did have a question, Ali, as you spotted there, around the sowing dates um, of the different trials. Do you happen to have any of that uh, in mind? <laughs> not to hand. Our particular trial shown there was sown a little bit late. Can you remember, Adrian, when it was sown? I think it was, I think it was early May. So it was, uh, yeah, something like early May, uh, basically when there was no rain and I spotted the trial being sown because of the dust storm I could see over the hill. <laughs> yes, yes, and it was sown as a mixture, a complete mixed, uh, hum, uh, completely mixed seed in, in, the, in, the, in the drill hopper. Um, for the trial I showed before that, which is down the borders, I'd have to check, I'm afraid. I don't think I have that to hand, although I will have a little look while the next person's speaking, and if I can find it in my files, I'll put it in the chat. Great, thanks, Ali. Um, and just to pick up on, on one of the questions that came through when um, people registered, um, a few people were asking around kind of conservation benefits, biodiversity benefits for farmland birds, chick food, um, is there any experience across the, the trials that you're working with either that you could comment on? So the trials we've been working on, we've probably done more on invertebrates, biodiversity than farmland birds. Um, and we have seen some evidence that of increased abundance of certain beneficial invertebrates. So things like pollinators, hoverflies, for example. Um, we, we see a greater abundance in a, in a pea barley mixture than we would do in a monoculture alone. Um, we have been, we are interested in looking at whether that translates into 
uh, improved pollination or hoverflies are also interesting because they, they um, also act as biocontrol agents. So we're also looking at things like um, insect pest control, particularly aphids. Um, but we, we're sort of early stages of that. I don't think I, I would um, be able to give um, detailed data or after we've got one year's data and haven't completely analysed the second year. But there, there's some promising indications that in mixtures, there's low abundance of insect pests and also in a year for, um, for, for pathogen establishment, and not every year is a bad pathogen year, but in, we do have some indications that pathogen establishment is reduced or suppressed in, in these crop species mixtures. Um, but yeah, well, I think we've, we, we're still waiting on gathering data over several years to, to give firm evidence. But that is one of the benefits that, that people propose with, with mixtures, that obviously you're increasing the diversity of the vegetation, so increasing the diversity of resources and the abundance of resources for other organisms. And some of these organisms play important function, functional roles relative, uh, that are important for crop production. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think Charlotte will pick up um, on some of the farmer experiences in the um, English field lab as well. Um, Rob, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think just with respect to the conservation benefits, so um, as Ali was saying, you know, invertebrates are a good uh, group of organisms to look at. And certainly uh, we're planning on using those as species for the kids to look at as well. So we're going to try some citizen science with them in these mixtures. So have the kids uh, recording some of the major invertebrate groups in these systems and one of the other one of the other species that i think we'll try to look up well we'll see if we can look at some of the um ground nesting farmland birds one of the species that's been quite important in northeast scotland there's been quite a lot of effort on it i think is corn bunting and um, there's good evidence to suggest that it likes to nest in crops where there's actually quite a complex canopy structure and one of the problems with sort of quite monoculture cereal is you really don't get that um, and so by increasing the complexity of, of the canopy by having the crop mixtures in there, uh, you might actually be creating a better um, nesting habitat, even a small patch of it for some of these rarer farmland birds. So I hope that's something we can look at over the next couple of years in some of these trials. Fascinating. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'll just pick up on Mark's question there around the seeding rates. Um, were conventional seed rates cut by 50% for both barley and peas, or were seeding rates maintained to result in greater plant competition sorry yeah just making sure i understand that mm -hmm. so um so right i was just typing that so what, so, basically so, was, so, it, yeah, was yeah. it a 50 50 mix or was there an a greater than 50 so you know, maybe higher... I'll, I'll i'll answer it this way and see if this answers because i had another question from somebody else on this so mm -hmm. if we went for a 40 60 mix of pea to barley we're sowing based on the number of seeds per unit area of land. So a 40% barley will be 40% of the seed number that we would stand usually apply in a monoculture. So say you're going for 300 seeds, barley seeds per meter squared, then we're doing 40% of that. Uh, sorry, getting mixed up here. Um, 40, if, if we're going for something like, I don't know, 80 seeds, pea seeds per per meter squared for P, then we're doing 40% of that. The barley is the other 60%. So say we're going for I know, 300 seeds per meter squared for barley in a monoculture, we'd be saying sowing at 60% of that rate. So it's 40% of the monoculture density of the legume, 60% of the monoculture sowing density of the cereal. And that's what we mean by a 40-60. You could do the same for a 50-50. Mm -hmm. So it's not that 50% of the seeds are peas and 50% of barley, it's 50% of the monoculture standard sowing density. Does that answer, because there were a few people who messaged about that, does that, does that explain what our approach is better? Yes, thank you. Brilliant. Um, and then just to pick up on these other questions, one around um, are any tie-up with RET RE school children on farm? Uh, yes, so I'll just reply to that one. So yes, uh, Royal Holland mm. Education Trust, one of the project partners, which is great. great. Brilliant. You know, so that's really good. 
So one, oh, sorry, you have there. Yeah, so one final question on this one then. Are, it's something that came up quite a bit around, are these practices economic um, and what's kind of commercial? Is, is this profitable? What's the impact on gross margins or is it is it economic? So is that, <laughs> shall I answer that? If you're happy to, Ali, yeah. But I, think, <laughs> but I think maybe as well, we can pick that up as we go through the next couple of speakers because obviously yeah. sort of Andrew and yeah. Gordon are, are, are trying these things uh especially gordon on a commercial basis so maybe they can also feed into that discussion because obviously like the like a lot of these things the answer unfortunately is going to be it depends right absolutely yeah, yeah absolutely so i think from the Pro diversify project our answer would be as rob says it depends but profit margins do tend to be improved with intercropping not always but that's that is a, a sort of average response across all of our farmers but of course it does depend just like any farming practice it depends on the weather and, and many other factors so will intercropping make you lots more money possibly not but will it stabilize your profits and uh, through by stabilizing yields it's there's there's a chance that it will help there's a good chance that it will contribute to that um, and will it provide some of the other benefits you might be looking for like in reducing inputs like improving pest weed disease suppression um, improving soil health um, improving biodiversity yes it can contribute to all of these um, these aims these outcomes but there is a big element a, hel a healthy dose of it does depend as well yeah fantastic great so I think, sorry could i just follow up yeah. with that um I suppose one of the things and one of the key reasons for doing the policy maker outreach is that the benefits, the financial benefits of some of the things that Ali talked about, like soil carbon, are going to depend in part on what farmers get paid for. And so there's a role there for having those discussions with policymakers and, and letting them know about the benefits of, of crop mixtures and seeing how that can be at least introduced into the discussion about what future payment mechanisms might look like. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we need to make sure these integrated options are, are part of the picture there. Fantastic. OK, I think we'll try and pick up on some more of the questions as we get into the discussion. And um, I think we'll move on to Andrew now, who's going to share experience of the seven different cereal legume mixtures they're trying in, in, in terms of seeking to understand the, some of the practicalities of establishment and harvest. Um, let me click on your slide, there, Andrew. And unmute you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, hi everyone. My name's Andrew Gilchrist from Scottish Agronomy. Welcome from a thundery Persia. Uh, Scottish Agronomy are a, an arable advisory group. Um, we work up and down Scotland. We've got a network of trial sites. We were very keen to become involved in this uh, Siemens project because we could see some of the potential benefits of moving away from monoculture. <clears throat> so potentially improving soil structure, potential advantages in pest and disease control, reducing our reliance on <clears throat> synthetic pesticides, which I think everybody realizes are um, declining at a, quite an alarming rate and look at the benefits for following crops. So we've also been quite involved with uh, RET on the educational side for a few years, and this was an additional opportunity for us to <clears throat> you know, add to that. Unfortunately, that for obvious reasons, that hasn't happened this year, but you know, looking ahead to the next couple of years of the project, hopefully we can you know, bring more kids in and just educate them a wee bit more about food production. Um, so on our trial site um, near Glen Rothes and Fife, we established seven different um, mixtures. So firstly, we looked at the practicalities. We looked at mixtures that you can sew together and also mixtures that you can hopefully harvest together. So 
Some of the more established mixtures that have been used in forage crops for years are peas and oats. Uh, you can see in that picture, uh, that's one of the other potential issues, obviously, with these mixtures is in terms of controlling weeds. So we've got a very limited suite of herbicides that can be used on, on both, both of these crops. So that, that is one of the common issues, unfortunately. Uh, now the peas and oats, they were sown at 65% of the cereal um, seed rate for the, the, the oats and 35% of the, the pea seed rate. The, the varieties were Kingfisher peas and Conway oats. Okay, so that's the first of the, the mixtures we looked at. If you can go on to the next one. Next one was beans and oats. So less commonly grown as a, a commercial mixture, but uh, we looked at 80% uh, of the oats seed, normal seed rate and 20% of the beans seed rate. Again, unfortunately, the gap in the middle of the plots there shows you that the weed control was a, um, a bit of a nightmare. Okay, on to the next one. Peas and peas, peas, oats and uh, sorry, beans, oats and peas. Um, so we threw in a, a three-way mix here, and that was based on 55% of the oats seed rate, 20% of the beans, and 20% of the peas. Okay, next one. Barley and clover. Now this was looking more at the, the following crop as a potential benefit. So under sowing barley with clover, that was two separate exercises. So we sowed the barley first with um, a heggy plot drill and then the, the, the clover was stitched into the, the barley. So the mix there was 90% of the, the normal barley seed rate and 30% of white clover. Okay, this one was a bit more left field. Uh, this is beans and spring oil seed rape. So again, debatable whether we can actually harvest these together, but uh, we, we will attempt to do so. Um, so we've got um, Oil seed rape in there at 20% of the normal seed rate and beans in at 80%. But unfortunately, neither of those, because of the drought, germinated particularly well. So it's absolutely um, full of weeds. But that was the driest April we've, we've ever had. So it was pretty extreme. Okay, so that's, that's all the mixtures we we put in. Um, again, I touched on the practicalities. It's very important if we're going to persuade farmers to, to go with these mixtures that, yes, they are economic and practical. So this is a learning exercise. We have replicated all of these plots. So hopefully we will get, you know, statistical yield information back for, you know, from all of these mixtures. Um, to indicate um, if there's a st stability and yield between the, the replicates. Um, but it's been a very difficult year. I think probably, you know, whatever is typical, I don't know. But certainly it was very untypical for Scotland to have a driest April and one of the driest Mays back to back. So that definitely hampered the, the germination of the pulses in the mix in particular. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, the intention is we will we will definitely try and take these all to, to yield um, if we can, and we'll see what the sample looks like, and we'll hopefully generate some some statistical yield data from that. But again, an interesting, very interesting exercise, and we're we're very keen to to learn more. So Thanks. I think that's everything I had to say unless there's any questions. We have got, we've got one question here from Alex. Why was the beans at such a low percentage in the bean oat trial? I guess that's 
yeah, in, terms, in all of them, it, it, would you, in retrospect, change any of the seed rates as their... Um, they, these were really based on commercial experience on, on whole crop. Um, so in the past, that, that is kind of similar to the sort of ratios we've used. But yes, in hindsight, for this year, we would have definitely increased the, the pulse uh, percentage. But that's, yeah, crystal ball. Absolutely. So we'll probably expand this to look at different, um, different ratios for next year. And that's part of this process, really, isn't it? The same with the kind of involving the the different farms across the country in terms of looking at, you know, in different conditions, the kind of ratios yeah. that you need on different soil types. Um, there was a question on replicates. It's, it, there's three replicates in these trials. And I missed Mike Abrams question. Something came up. Um, so that's in regards to weed control. So I think that's another common issue, really, in terms of the limited herbicides that are available. Um, have you got any thoughts around kind of controlling weeds in mixtures? And perhaps Ali and Rob as well, if you have any thoughts on, on that. Well, my, my thoughts would be, yeah, it is, it is possibly the biggest issue if we've got conventional farming that has relied on very good weed control over the past 30, 40 years. And suddenly we've got a crop that has produced a mass of weed seed um, going back into the soil. That is, yeah, that's potentially a big, a big issue. Yeah. I just say something on, on weeds. So it's one of the things that we have tried to a degree this year and will be doing in future is, uh, and I think one of the core farmers did this as well, where you keep the um, main crops such as the barley at 100% and then add to that. So basically you're having a much more competitive crop early in the season. So rather than matching everything to 100% of the normal density of the crops by proportion, actually increasing the density, giving early better establishment and competition against the weeds, I think is probably one of the better ways to go there. There's obviously a cost implication and possibly um, developmental effects of that too. It's one of the things that we're going to be looking at. Yeah, we were using very free tillering uh, barley varieties there in, in terms of laureate. So, but yeah, to, I take your point, Adrian, that um, in the past we have seen a fine line between the, the, the having barley dominating that, that uh, pulse um, component as well. So it's, I think it depends on the type of season. I, th I think from our, from, from our experience, it very much depends on where you, whether you're coming in from a legume growing perspective or a cereal growing perspective, because in cereals fields, cereal growers tend to expect to be able to achieve weed clean fields, <laughs> whereas in legumes, it's, weeds can be a bit more of a challenge to suppress. And certainly in our experiments where we've been looking in conventional if there is such a thing as a standard conventional approach versus an integrated approach with fewer inputs um, and, and low, more of a low input management approach, we see better weed suppression in cereal legume mixtures when you compare with the legume crop. But we don't see as much yield weed suppression when you compare with the cereal crop. So I think it really depends where you come from and what your expectations are. But yes, crop being using standard crop protection products will be more of a challenge in cereal legume mixtures or, or in any different crop species in mixture. Um, but having said that, species mixtures, intercrops are used by um, a lot of farmers in low input systems as as the solution for weed control, or one of the solutions they're using for weed control in, in their um, low input system. So I think it, 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 it does depend where you're coming from, what the purpose is of, of the mixture that you're growing. There are other, uh, and, and Adrian mentioned other sort of management approaches that can be used to improve weed control, that, that reduce reliance on, on trying to find a chemical crop protection product that can that can be used in 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 a mixture um, there are other less standard approaches which we are collating 
uh, in, a, in a report that's being led by Stockbridge Technology Centre in, in our EU funded project Diversify, which will be available relatively soon, which lists a whole range of um, alternative chemical approaches and particularly mechanical management approaches and precision approaches that can be used to try and overcome issues such as weed control. Um, so we've got a thunderstorm. <laughs> um, um, so do do watch it. that's the space for for that coming out because I think it will be available relatively soon. Um, there there are a number of other solutions. They may not be as widely used, but we're what we're trying to do is provide that uh, information in a format that shows what's easy to do with existing farm equipment or what people generally have access to versus what's theoretically possible but might require more investment in machinery. Fantastic, thanks Sally. Um, and I think yeah, Charlotte will pick up a bit later what we've seen in the intercropping field lab experiences with the uh, with cereals in a pulse um, aiding that weed control. So um, Thank you very much. I'll pick up on one more question here. So from Mark, um, in choosing the mixes, do you consider species that ripen at similar times to avoid breakdown of one species before the other? So, um, so yeah, around convergence, I guess, in terms of how, what, how do you choose your species mixtures and it, what factors do you take into account? Shall I answer that one? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, we, yes, we do. Te we look quite carefully at the variety characteristics when we're choosing the species that we want to mix together. So maturity times is one of the things we looked at. We look at, um, and we do try and choose varieties that are going to have relatively similar. We won't. We wouldn't try and put an early maturing barley with a late maturing bean, for example. That wouldn't make sense to yeah. us but um but so we are looking at maturing maturity times but we're also looking at some of the other characteristics like um disease susceptibility and you know whatever information there is on these varieties to try and optimize what we want to get out of the mixture i i, I guess a a common theme that i'll tr keep saying is it really depends on why somebody wants to grow a species mixture and what you want to achieve it if you want looking for a, a grain a grain yield then you have a, a different particular set of requirements that you need to satisfy and to achieve that if you're looking for to support your cash crop and your cash crops a cereal and you want to support that by reducing your nitrogen inputs or or getting a better you know, weed control or disease control then you know the, the characteristics that you're looking for in the varieties that you use will be different so I think it, it very much depends on what the aim is of of growing into crop. What if there's a particular challenge you're trying to to resolve, or if it's if it's you're aiming to get two cash crops um, with greater land use efficiency. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and we had a comment here from Duncan saying that no till in has aided um, his mixtures or could be a solution, so it hasn't received any pre or post um, herbicide. And then Steve Belcher from PGRO suggesting, I know they've done um, well with a PB mix, and I guess there you've got common crop protection. So that's one way around that as well. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. I think now we'll pass over to Gordon for a farmer's experience of, of fitting this of mixed cropping into the rotation um, and a bit around his experience with that. Gordon. Yes, hello and uh, good evening everybody. Um, <coughs> Gordon Cairns from Stracathum Estates. We are in very north of Angus, almost on the Aberdeenshire border. A mixed estate with uh, renewable energy, forestry, sporting property interests and 1,200 hectares of, of arable cropping. And for the last eight or nine years we have had no livestock on the farm at all, so we have been purely arable and selling mainly to a commodities market. Now the big change we've had in the last three years was the introduction of a, an AD plant on the estate and therefore we have the job of supplying feedstock for that. The feedstock requirements are somewhere between 36 and 40,000 tonnes a year and that brings quite a headache because you have to produce that amount of crop every year. So within that we, we look at various alternatives of what we can do. Uh, and, and what can we grow? 
and and with May's being out of the question here, we, we sort of we have to think about what we can do to every year hit that, that, that sort of target of producing these kind of reels. So, and so what do we grow? And in effect, what we've really done for the first few years is we just stick to what we knew best and what we, we can do. So we, we've been growing grass, whole crop cereals, predominantly predominantly rye, and uh, sugar beet, stroke fodder beet as a, a, an energy crop for the ED plant. So, yeah, that's fine. But what we're actually really trying to produce is as much biomass or, or dry matter per hectare as we possibly can. So hence the, the sort of interest in, in, in mixed cropping. And again, that's, that's something that's not new. We're not reinventing the wheel here. Because in effect, we're, we're, we're producing arable silage, which is something that people have done in the livestock sector. And we've done that for a long number of years. And it, it hasn't been a particularly scientific approach to it. We're, we're just sort of feeling our way into it. Uh, last year we grew a uh, first crop of, of multi-crop for the AD plant and that went quite well so it's encouraged us to, to go again this year and, and the link in with, with the seams and everything it all tied in very nicely. So that, that's really the, the big change we've had in the estate is, is supplying feedstock to this AD plant. The objective as I say is trying to produce as much biomass per hectare as we possibly can. In a, and keeping that in a sort of sensible arable rotation. So the, the, the mixed cropping, so I think last year we, we grew a, a, a crop of, of grass, oats and peas, which, which worked really quite well. And this year what we've, we've got on the ground is just a, a mix of, of uh, rye and, and beans. Now, Establishment and you know all that has to be sort of carried out with our own equipment. We haven't rushed out and bought any fancy kits, so it's we we'll keep things simple and straightforward as we possibly can, and just using what what kit we've got. And a bit like what people have said, you know what what seed rates do we use, what crop mixes do we use, and it's it's really just a case of, of suck it and see and see how we get on. And in the sort of theory that if we put enough seed in the ground and get enough quick cover, we might managed to beat some of the weeds. So the, the, the rye and bean mix we put in this year was actually sort of 60% of, of, of each. We were 120 kilograms of, of, uh, of uh, rye in the seed bed and 125 kilograms of, of beans. And it was no more scientific than that. It was to try and get ground cover and, and get to, to beat the weeds. It's a very dry year. I mean, we drilled this crop in the uh, 27th of March and into dust dry seed bed and it stayed that way for a long time. So I mean, it was it's you know it was a real real try, uh, you know. And as you can see from that slide there, we have a considerable amount of weeds in the, in the crop as well. We have a, a split the fields. We have a, a section that's that's a monocrop of rye and a monocrop of beans, and the, the rest of the, the field is, is is the whole crop. The other thinking behind this is to try and build in some sort of resilience into the thing because we're growing more crops of rye and it has been quite a challenge for us. And the last four years of doing that, we've had two years of really quite severe spring droughts and, and that has affected our rye yield really quite significantly. First year we grew rye as a, as a, a crop on the, on the farms here. We had you know, big yields, average 45 tonnes a hectare, up to over 60 tonnes a hectare. And you know, can't go wrong with that. That's giving us a, a sort of dry matter yield of somewhere between 17 and 18 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. The following years, uh, you know, 2018, quite a severe drought. Yields were much diminished. Again, better cropping again in 19. This year we've had quite a severe drought, which is unusual for this part of the country. We're hoping that the, the, the multi-cropping will build in a, some sort of resilience and, and a combination of the, the more than one crop uh, offset the problems we've been having with establishment and, and containing yield through with the thing because uh, it certainly focuses the mind as I keep saying come back to having to produce 40,000 tonnes of feedstock for the same acreage every year. We've got to have some sort of resilience in the, in the system. The practicalities of it have been fairly straightforward of the multi-crop and again this year we've the, the spring sowing crop was following sugar beet so we cultivated the field uh, with a, a Simba Solo, which left quite deep ridges behind the, 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 the Double D Packer. Uh, 
on the back of the solo, we then broadcast the, the beans onto that cultivated seed bed and drilled the, the uh, rye conventionally with our Vatistat drill on top of that. So running at a slight angle to the, how the, the field was cultivated, we're then burying the beans two or three inches down and uh, that, that seems to work quite well there through the ground, roughly the same thing as the rye and got off to quite a good start. Seed bed, uh, uh, we had 30 cubic meters of, of uh, AD digested on there and, and we have put a split dose of nitrogen totaling 60 kilograms of nitrogen onto the field as, as liquid, the liquid nitrogen and that basically is the, the variable cost. We've got no chemical sprays for, for disease or for, for herbicides. So in effect it's, it's quite a cheap crop to establish and we hope in, that we have caught on top of most of the weeds. There are considerable amount of weeds there and as a purely arable farmer there's more weeds than we would probably like to see in a normal crop but we can we can live with that you know and it's it's as I say that resilience and reasonably cheap uh, variable costs. And I noticed that there was questions coming up there uh, is it economically viable and I think it, it is. We, we've seen reasonable gross margin returns on the mixed crop last year uh, as a as a to monocrops of rye and grass. Another big advantage for us with this, if we can get a multi-crop that we can get a good biomass and good dry matter yield in one harvest or one harvest operation, as opposed to having three, four, and maybe five cups of, of Italian rye grass to get to that same total yield. So again, that's, that's building in some sort of resilience. And the fact that this is a spring crop following you know, the sugar beet is meaning we're getting more crops in that, in, in that sort of two crop cycles, we're almost getting two and a half crops in a, in a two crop cycle, if you like. So, yeah, would we do it again? Absolutely. It's, uh, it's something I think has potential. Um, getting the right mixes and the right varieties, that's going to take some time till we get there, but I think it's certainly something we would, that we'd do again. Um, are we, yes, we harvest. Quite straightforward harvest is just with a, a whole crop header on our forage harvest. So again, there's no, you know, there's nothing complicated there. We've got the kit on a farm, and we will take us through and get a weight over the weighbridge, but it'll be no more scientific than that. So I'm afraid it's just a farm trials, and, and that's that's how we'll get it. Um, and and, that, and that's it. You know, it's it's. Uh, I think there's a lot of scope. Uh, and interest in this and it's something that we will run with and keep, keep trying to develop. Fantastic, thanks Gordon. Yeah, it's clear there's lots of benefits you're seeing there and kind of looking at this from a very integrated approach from the kind of whole rotation level and the benefit of the break there down to, to in the field as well. And I think um, the fact you're using your existing machinery overcomes some of those challenges I think a lot of people face there. Um, and being able to reduce your costs, like you say, um, you, you think that, that that does kind of address this the economics side in terms of the gross margin and... Well, absolutely. If we, can, if we can produce a decent crop yield off a spring sowing crop, I mean, uh, we're certainly going to reduce our, our, our uh, growing costs considerably. So that, that's, that has quite a potential for us, I think. And particularly if we can get a reasonably clean Break after having the break of 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 beat and the, the rotation, which you know it, it does help with the weed control. And if we can take this through without any chemical uh, applications, uh, I think that has to be a win-win for everything. And uh, as far as biodiversity as well as as, as actual uh, sort of commercial cropping. Absolutely, yeah. And so, if you did it again next year, would you do anything differently, or would you probably go the same seed seed rates and? Yeah. And I yeah well I, I what I would like to do and this is just and we'll need to take a bit of advice and maybe I'll have to speak to James Hutton about this but I would like to actually get some way of getting sort of maybe clover in that mix so that the clover is already there and established before we put grass in as a following crop so rather than trying to establish the grass with the clover it would been there and established and again that would give us a, a bit of a help as well with, with our uh, the, the nitrogen fractions uh, along with the, uh, the pulses. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, we've got a question here. Have any of the trials been checked with aerial imagery? 
that's probably a question for Ali and Rob there. So um, the trials that are at the James Hutton Institute, yes, we do look at crop reflectance. Um, Adrian actually does a lot of those measurements. Um, so yes, in our own trials at, at the sites outside the Institute, no, we, we haven't done those. What we tend to do when we visit them is do basic ground cover estimates by the crop, um, by any weeds and, and bare ground to get a feel for the canopy cover. We, we did try to uh, use the uh, available rate nitrogen imagery for, for the crop but because it was a multi-crop we just couldn't get a program to, to work so we right. just had to go flat rates. Um, we've got a question on do you change the row width? Are you working on a standard row width I guess? Or what kind of width are you working on here? Because it doesn't I'm definitely going to defer to Adrian for answering that question. Uh -huh. Adrian doesn't mind, <laughs> for our <laughs> trials at least. I, I couldn't tell you uh, um, for, for the trials out uh, that aren't on our site. 16.5 centimetres. Um, so it's a fairly narrow row width that we use, um, which is uh, it's because our plot drills, whether direct drill or um, conventional, are set up the same in that sort of way. Um, it, it's an area I think is uh, needs looking at, especially when it comes to mixing different crops because they behave so differently with competition. And of course, competition is all just down in the rows, so you could manipulate that. And I think it's an area re we really should look at. I was debating this with um, uh, one or two farmers recently, and quite a lot of them seem to think wider row widths than we use um, is doesn't give any more issues. My gut feeling is that that's harder to get immediate ground cover if you do that. And you, if you have wider road width, you may get more weeds as well, but um, I'm not sure I'm right on that. So I think it's something that really needs looking at. One thing I've, I've found, uh, and this is just purely by accident because it's the way we've done it, but having broadcast beans on, and not having the, the, the you know, more randomised feed immersions and not having them in rows did help because normally when we've drilled pulses in the past and you get roots in the this, this springtime and they just pick their way all the way up the row once they've they found the row and you get a lot of seed loss, plant loss like that but having the broadcast them on and a randomised plant immersions it seemed to help with, with that problem at least and yeah. as far as everything else goes we're just using standard farm drills so a row spacing will be dictated by the, the, the farm drill that's really interesting you say that because we've, we've seen, had variable amounts of, of bird damage to our trials and, and it, you do see these sort of complete areas where they've just picked out the legumes. But Adrian, that reminds me of some of the work that you've done on cultivar mixtures where you've looked at different sowing arrangements, complete mixtures versus patchy mixtures. And if I remember rightly, found that some of the best benefits in terms, um, in terms of disease control anyway were in completely run patchy mixtures is that have i remembered that correctly yes uh, in fact a crude patchy mixture seems to be best and this is probably because um disease might get going in patches but then it's got a much bigger break for it gets to more susceptible uh, areas whereas everything is evenly mixed you probably get much more um uh, <sighs> transmission from plant to plant of the same type and thing, things like this. Um, so uh, that's probably the reason for that. Uh, so yeah, it, it, that also means that when you're mixing things, instead of going to the trouble of making sure it's really homogeneously mixed, actually you may get benefits from doing it fairly crudely, which is good news as far as practicalities are concerned. Yeah, and on that, oh, sorry. No, oh, sorry, I think you're going to say the same thing. Go for it, Katie. Yeah, I was just going to pick up on Alex's question. I guess that's looking at kind of strip, strip cropping and looking at rows. Um, have you done any work with that or is there any work within Diversify? So there is, not in Diversify, but I know other projects that are working on this. So yes, th that, that approach can also be used. Depends a little bit on what um, sewing drilling equipment you have access to. Yeah. But one option is to, rather than, put everything together in the same seed hopper and just sew it all as, as a 
a complete mix. You could try and target the way you sow it by if you've got access to drills that, that can that have different hoppers, so you can sow alternate rows, for example. The, the example given there is two two of bean and two of wheat. So there is work um, to look at that. Um, the one I'm uh, the piece of work that most recently that I'm aware of was looking at strip intercropping. So you have a you know, a, a, a metre or two metre strip that is sown with one crop and then an adjacent crop uh, is, is the um, second crop and trying to achieve intercropping in that way. And what this work has shown is that the greater distance apart the two crops are, the fewer the benefits, which you might expect mm. because they're interacting less. Yeah. So there is a sweet spot, spot uh, in terms of how many rows um or bands of of crop that you want to achieve but it probably varies a little bit depending on the species that you're trying to grow together um so i think adrian's right that we do need some this is an area where so the two areas that i can see is what what proportions to grow in the mix and whether to go for a sort of 100% overall sowing density or whether you're going to go for more than 100% and then how do you spatially place those crops relative to each other and is there any benefit in trying to be very precise in where you place them over as adrian said just sort of randomly patchily throwing them in you know where, where do the benefits where are the benefits most consistent and that's where we're we're seeing some evidence to say that 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 or put some 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 results which are suggesting that that's where it's worth investing further research efforts so they can't completely answer your question but we're aware that that it's it's something that um, needs more investment of effort yeah it was a point brought up earlier as well where about saying that two crops are at different times as well so you can get them both at optimum times and things like this so as well spatially temporarily as well obviously you've got to then go in at different um you're having to go through twice and so and things and where that pays off in terms of the benefit but i don't think we should neglect that either mm. we actually did try that this year unfortunately our second sowing was after it was so incredibly dry it really established very badly so we, we didn't test that very well this year but uh, potentially that's another area which could be worth the effort yeah so i see that there's a question yes you're right there's a question on that any work done on relay intercropping in the uk i'm not aware of it in the uk i'm aware of it outside the uk on the continent and further afield um i guess the other side to consider is that is that relay intercropping if you're not saying is a complete mixture that you're managing as a as a single crop if you like then there will be machinery pass considerations so there will be more machinery passes if you're sowing at different timings or harvesting at different timings and, and so you know that's where the balance comes between the benefits and the profit margins yeah brilliant okay thank you um i think that we've got a, another question come up there but i think we'll pick up that in the discussion um in terms of um looking at different op options for establishment i think charlotte will talk about one of the farmers that is using machinery that with two hoppers that allows him to establish a crop and um, so I'll pass on to Charlotte now. Thank you so much, Gordon, for, for sharing your experience. And then um, hopefully we can pick up on more of that later. Charlotte. Okay, thanks, Katie. And uh, good evening, everyone. Hope you're all doing OK. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'm just going to talk a bit about our experiences working with the Diversify Intercropping Group in England and Wales to share some stories from trials that farmers have been doing in different parts of the country. So this, this um, group is linked up also with the Innovative Farmers mm -hmm. Programme and you can find out more online or from about all the trials that I'm going to present by visiting their website if you want to have a bit more information. I haven't gone into detail on all the equipment and um, seed rates on every trial but you will find it all there. Okay next slide please Katie. So when working with this group we've been trying to identify the different agronomic challenges that the crop mixtures can be used to address, but also the challenges that they present. And our first farmer, James Hares here, who farms in Wiltshire, he was looking at addressing the wild oat 
burden that he had on his farm and his bean crop it was kind of getting um too much and he was finding it really difficult to grow beans so he wanted to try with intercropping with wheat so to test this he left a strip of beans without wheat at the side and then we went out and tested and measured whether there was any difference in the weed abundance between these two um controls the control and the treatment in two years okay next slide please so across the two years we found a remarkably similar difference in the amount of uh, weed biomass when we went out sampling in may um and that was about a reduction of about 75 percent so we would need to conduct some more trials to really test the yield and quality differences but he didn't see any big impact on yield um in that he actually had a better yield when he combined the crop of beans and wheat the challenge with the weeds was so bad last year that he had to destroy his monoculture crop because of the weed burden of the wild oats being so high so we really have seen the benefit of the intercrop in this case and it, it, it goes back to what ali was saying in terms of looking at that final target of end use and the fact that he was trying to control the weeds in his legume crop and the cereals was an added bonus and he was using this for feed on his farm so that's also a way that he's got around the challenges of separation. Okay thanks Katie. So the next farm that we've uh, been running trials with is Andy Howard in Kent. He's a uh, studied for his Nuffield scholarship on intercropping and has trialled many different crop mixtures over the, over the years. This particular trial was quite interesting because it was looking at a different challenge. It was looking at how we could use crop mixtures to help with pest control. So he was using the oats as a kind of nurse crop at the beginning of establishment to help with flax flea beetle. Um, next slide please Katie. So he established replicate strips across the field that he then harvested separately and we were able to find that then the treatments with oats, he also tested different seed rates, um, there was a higher lead, linseed yield. It was difficult to, to, to determine whether that was down to the differences in pest control but there was some indication that there was differences in presence of Black flea beetle, but it was low, so we would have to go and do some further assessments to test that more fully. Okay, next slide, please. So he's running, uh, trialing this crop mixture again this year, and he was very satisfied with the results from the intercrop of linseed and oats and the kind of relative increase in yield boost of about 17 to 19 percent that we found the year before. So he'll report back on how that goes again this year. Okay, great, next slide, please. So another crop mixture that he trialed last year was oil, seed, rape, peas and oats. And he was trying to address two challenges with this one. So firstly, pest and disease pressure, but also the uh, ability of the oil, seed, rape to act as a support for peas, which are susceptible to lodging. So once again, he established replicated strips across the field and trial different seed rates as well as the effect of intercropping. Okay, great. Next slide, please. So in this trial, there was some indication that the presence of oats led to reduced pest and disease damage in the oilseed rape. However, he's had a couple of bad years of spring oilseed rape establishment and um, really we'd consider this trial not a success because we, there wasn't really much oilseed rape there. <laughs> So that meant that we also weren't really able to test the scaffolding effect for the peas. However, we did find all in all that he had a good healthy crop of peas and there wasn't any impact of having these oat or, pea, uh, oat or oil seed rape in with his peas. Okay, thanks. So as I mentioned, he's trialing lots of different planting combinations and this year Andy's got a trial further exploring scaffolding benefits, but this time of using the oat to support peas and also trialing the oats supporting his lentil crop. He's also been doing bean and oat trials with PGRO and uh, Steve's here in the audience. So if we have many more questions on that, 
and I'm sure he'll be happy to discuss that afterwards. He's also uh, trying underserving the microclover. Um, sorry, could you go back? Thanks. And other types of uh, living mulches have been explored by other farmers in our group. So as you can see in the photos, we've got the bean and oat trial there, and that is actually looking at the, some of these questions around um, different spatial orientations for planting of the crop mixtures. Okay, thanks. So first, oh yeah, <laughs> first observations from Andy on this trial was that, I've just got some notes from him here, um, he's found that the field fertility leads to different responses of the component parts. So when he's observed parts of the field with higher fertility, he thinks that the oats are becoming more dominant or there's fewer beans as the, as the field in the lower fertility parts of the field. And the disease assessments which have been conducted by PGRO have shown a reduced incidence of disease in the intercrop. And the whole field is managed at a low input level with just one application of foliar nitrogen at six kilograms per hectare. So that's how we're seeing this kind of variation in the nitrogen levels across the field. Um, okay, next slide, please. This is an image of the peas and oats trial with the test for lodging. Um, his initial observations on this trial were that it wasn't a bad lodging year. There was some lodging, but um, he felt that the peas were still green in places, but were greener when the, there was a lower seed rate, seed rate of oats. So he's interested in kind of looking at these questions around maturation and different varieties when it comes to this plant, uh, crop mixture combination. Okay, next slide. So one of the reasons that Andy is able to try all these different types of crop mixtures is because he has built his own on-farm separator. And this also feeds into determining what com crop combinations he goes grows because he wants to know that he can separate them using his kit. Um, I haven't uh, got a lot of time to go into the details here, but if and if you have any questions about the separator and his approach here, Andy will be happy to respond and get in touch with you. Just let, let me know and we can put you in touch. Okay, next slide please, Katie. And another challenge, another farmer addressing the challenging of scaffolding was uh, Mark Lee, who farms in Shropshire at Green Acres Farm. In this case, the end market has driven his need for intercropping as he's growing a older variety of pea called Harlem peas for a niche market. He grows for a specialist producers, Hodmodods, British grain and legumes. Um, so he wanted to test different rates of triticale that support his pea crop and prevent lodging and make harvest more easy and also hopefully improve the quality of the pea. Okay, thanks. He also has livestock on farm, so we'll be using the trip for feed. So he did find that including the trip helped with lodging and that there were differences in relation to the different seed rates that he try, tried. They also related, determined the amount of weed seed that he found, he's been an organic farmer, and also um, the overall yield that he got from his peas. All in all, he decided that he preferred the 30% seed rate relative density because that he felt that was best when he was harvesting in terms of uh, usability and um, workability. So he then decided to trial two extremes of either 20% or 40% with trip the next year. And unfortunately, it was a really challenging year and he had not very good pea yields. And then the 40% was definitely too high. In hindsight, and um, he went and had some tests done and he found that he does have a problem with foot rot. In his, so he's now looking at exploring different ways to use legumes in his rotation. And that's another challenge which we haven't touched on yet in using um, intercropping is that the impact that it then goes on to have on your rotation and when you fit your legumes and your cereals in. So that's something that he's interested in looking at some more. Okay, next slide please. So he also separates on farm and we're currently 
working on a, some videos for the Diversify project. So if you want to learn more about how Mark separates his Carlin Peas and Tricaly, tune in on our website very shortly and you'll be able to watch a film about that amongst many other things. It touches on the experiences of farmers and researchers across the whole of Europe working on the project. And I think it will be quite interesting for everyone here today. So yeah, tune in online and follow us on social media at Plant Teams. Thanks, Katie, I think. Oh yeah, and then, so we've been thinking a bit about alternative end uses through Mark growing his kind of more uh, niche crops and James Hutton Institute are also working on this. So we've got a couple of slides here talking about alternative products that can be made from legumes and also intercrops. Um, so they've done some work on gin production and it'd be great for them to come in and tell us a bit more about that. And also they've, like um, Rob already touched on, doing this full life cycle analysis of the environmental impacts from the whole level of across the production cycle. I'm not going to go into detail because I know we're kind of getting short for time again, but if anyone wants to feed in on this, it, I think it's really interesting. Oh, you're muted, Katie. Great, thank you, Charlotte. And um, yeah, I think it's really interesting that, you know, how those farmers have thought through kind of their priority crop, their key agronomic objective for doing it into crop and then yeah, how to handle that end use is obviously critical as well. Um, Alex has a question around combining and harvest. Are, are there any reports of issues with harvest, either differences in crop height or amount of biomass? Um, has any, anyone on the on have you come across any issues with harvest? Um, so that was something that I think Mark was worried about with his trit and peas, but I haven't known any if issues at harvest come about. I mean, Ali mentioned in that, that at the beginning of the Diversify project, we ran these workshops looking at what people were already working with in terms of intercrops and also the challenges that people felt needed to be addressed. And harvest complexity did come up quite a lot as one of those challenges. But in my experience working with this group of farmers, I haven't found it to be the case. I don't know because you've worked with them as well, Katie. You haven't. Yeah, no, the, I don't think they came across any issues. Like you say, it was one of the objectives of, of Mark Strauss was to, to look at how to improve harvestability. Um, I guess it's more, it's around, I guess, the difficult deciding when to combine is yeah so Andy has said that that's been a challenge this year with his peas because they were were greener um and he's with the lentils he said that, that he's just having the oats are having to wait now so you know I think it depends a bit on the season as well um it, it's kind of a bit down to judgment at the end of the day yeah I'd, I'd say, say the same from our trial experiences that the co combining generally is down to the timing of maturity, any issues. So for example, 2018, that really dry year, the peas in our pea barley mixture matured much quicker than the barley, which was the complete opposite to what happened the previous year. And also the peas were, were splitting. So they were dropping, the pods were opening, the seeds were splitting and dropping out. We, we didn't get very good pea harvest out of that barley pea harvest because we'd lost a lot of the peas in the way and even the ones we did get were split and, and that led to problems with with separation um so yeah but all that those issues really stemmed out come back down to the timing of the, the convergence of maturity and it didn't happen that year in that particular combination but in other combinations it was fine other species combinations so um I think the only time we've had real issues with actually physically combining the crop was when we were very ambitious last year and did a six species mixture. Um, and we knew we knew we were we were asking too much of the of the combine um, because they uh, they just didn't they, there was no way we were going to get those to coincide to mature for seed maturity at the same time. So um, and that was very difficult to combine. Um, the other time we had an issue was more to do with weeds, um, where, where we didn't we had um, the, the legume failed to or part yeah the legume failed to establish in the intercrop that was last year in one of our larger scale trials, 
and the weeds really got away and that created problems for 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 harv for combining that trial but those are uh, out of multi many many different intercrop trials those are the those were the yeah a small number where we couldn't where it was physically difficult to combine the tr the crop um as i say most of the issues seem to be about timing development of the crop but, timing and i just make a comment about winter peas and winter barley uh, last year the peas ripened earlier than the barley in the monocultures we had very big losses but in the mixtures uh, we we harvested far more peas so even though the peas were a lower proportion of the total we were still getting more off the pea barley mixtures than the pea alone because the losses were, were so high in the monocultures in that particular case so it's just it's a frame you know the scaffold to hold them up which delivered in that case even when you had a mismatch of dates fantastic thank you um, I think I just had a power cut then, so if I do disappear at any point, that will be why. Um, I think um, we are running out of time. We have got time for one more question. I don't know if anyone in the audience has got um, a burning question they'd like to ask. Um, if not, perhaps we'll pick up on the energy question and the LCA and kind of looking at energy carbon analysis. I don't know if anyone... Um, but James Hutton, if you have any experience on on that side, well, I mean, I just I replied to the comment, and I I think it's a really <laughs> open question, obviously, because now what we're looking at is not just the sort of um, uh, well, it's just the carbon balances of some of these activities, and that's extremely difficult to get a handle on if you look at the sort of whole life cycle of some of these products, and if you can actually grow some of these legumes in Scotland and develop products such as Pete's beans rather than importing the legumes from South America, for example. So maybe maybe you are increasing the amount of um, machinery use within a farm in Scotland, but you're actually offsetting that against a massive sort of transglobal transport of some of these products. So it's actually quite a complicated analysis to do that pros and cons trade-off, both financially and in terms of other metrics like carbon. But it is something that people are looking at now. And and I think there's an even bigger drive to get a handle on that after um, COVID, which has shown that our global food supply chains are fragile. And things that impact on transport mean our assumptions about what we can get from everywhere in the world, which is how we feed ourselves at the moment, will have to be changed. So this work that Hobbit does, for example, is doing to look at sort of food production from, from old, old legume varieties in the UK is really important. And that's something that we... We hope to get to the point of with seams as well. So we might be asking, for example, uh, local buyers of food for um, for schools, what, why are they not taking some of these legumes that are produced locally and, and introducing those into the sort of food they're producing in schools and things like that. So, yes, there's work on it, but it is it is incredibly complicated to do a full balanced analysis mm -hmm. for some of these things. Absolutely. Yeah, I know within the Diver Impacts project, they're trying to grapple with that at a farm level as well, but it's it's complex. Um, but yeah, as Lorna mentions there, it's kind of yeah, around this kind of shortening of the chain and there's opportunity for that at the moment, for sure. Um, so I think um, on that note, I think that we will stick around um, a bit after the call if anyone wants to, has any burning questions they want to ask, but I'll, I'll finish us up on time. If um, Basically, in a nutshell, I guess if you're deciding on a plant team combination, it's kind of thinking through what your key objectives are, thinking about the traits of the, of the different components, thinking about your priority and the end uses. Um, and I think we're, we're, it's clear we're all still learning. So this kind of keeping this sharing between farmers and researchers um, is really important here. So here's some of the opportunities to get more involved if, if you want to try things out. Um, so within Scotland, there's the, the SEAMS network and opportunities within the SEAMS project that Rob's mentioned. So Rob's emailed there and I will send the, all of these out afterwards. Um, and also the Innovative Farmers group up there. Um, in the east of England, the PGRO, so I think we've got Steve and Roger on here, they're looking for farmers within two hours radius of Peterborough um, who are interested in uh, intercrops with pulses. Um, and I've got Roger's email there. And then within England and Wales, um, Charlotte and I are working with the intercropping field lab that she mentioned. So you can get in touch with us and we'll send all that out afterwards. 
Um, we also have lots of resources on agroecology, so that includes videos from previous field days, so out on Andy's farm and also on Mark's farm, um, on agroecology on Twitter and um, various resources and technical guides. Um, and we will pull together some of those that have been mentioned today on the website. Um, and we will be doing a series, continuing these series of online field days as well. So keep an eye on the website and we hope to see you all again soon at one of them. Um, but just want to say a massive thank you to all of our speakers um, for sharing your experiences and lots of very practical insights there. And to all of you for joining us um, and um, hope to see you all again soon.